and greetings, salutations, and highs and howdies from the great state of Florida, the city of Tampa Bay, home of the Super Bowl champs, home of the Stanley Cup champs. And yes, we do understand we have no ice down here, but we can still win a Stanley Cup. And number one in the American League East. So we'll likely have another boat parade you guys can watch when we win that one as well. My name is Mike Blinder. I am the publisher of ENP Magazine, and I'm your host for the next hour as we go through a case study. Before I bring in my great panel today, um, I'd like to do some quick housekeeping. You are on a platform I'm sure you're exceptionally aware of by now called Zoom. Um, we're not using Zoom Meeting, which I know most of you use when you're now using it for whatever you're doing in your business. We're actually using a platform called Zoom Webinar, which means I'm in control of the audio and I can bring people in and out that way because we've had almost 200 register for this. If we were to allow all the audio to come in and everybody to jump in, it would be kind of a kegger, don't you agree? So we're gonna use one place for you to interact with us, which is chat. We're not gonna be watching the Q&A or raise your hand buttons at the bottom of your screen, but we are all gonna be monitoring the chat room. Now keep in mind with Zoom Webinar for some strange reason, when you go into the chat room, the first thing it does is it defaults to panelists only, which means only our panel will see your questions. And with your kind permission, I'd like this to be an open dialogue where everyone, all that are attending, as well as the panelists, can see your interaction. So just do me a favor, go there, switch it before you do any chat, any questions, any comments, share any information you want with the entire forum today to panelists and attendees. With that being said, I'd like to bring in my Gold ribbon panel, if I may. I have Corey Elliott, Corey Elliott, my executive VP at Burrell Associates. Corey, I'm glad we got the good looking one today and not Gordon. Oh, wow, um, very nice. And you, you've all, you, I must not be very good looking because you've turned off my video. I have turned off your video, sir. I'm going to bring you right back up. <laughs> Please believe me, sir. That is, that is totally, completely my fault. But then again, you know how it is, Corey. Yep. And sometimes, you know, Zoom acts on its own and says, this guy, let's see, I go up here and say, ask to start video. There you go, sir. Now you should be set. All right, here we go. Now, Corey is uh, with Borel Associates. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking to Brian today. Could Brian, you are our case study person, your vice president of Pamplin Media Group, and a very good friend of mine, who I've been working with diligently is Julia Campbell, general manager of the Branded Content Project. But for now, what I'm gonna do is turn off my screen and let Corey turn his on so we can actually get the lay of the land now, if we can, from Corey. And Corey, what I'm really looking for now is the information that we all started seeing Burrell put out that shows there's really an appetite out there right now in the advertising world for branded sponsored content. So. Corey, why don't you give us an overview of the latest and greatest data that Burrell has on that? Sure. Thanks, Mike. And everybody, you can see my screen, right? Yes, it's all sir. cool. Okay. I'm dividing this up into three sections as far as time goes. I want to show you a little bit of information from October of 2020 and then uh, two different periods this year. If you don't know, little uh, history Burrell Associates, we are in the business of local market research and local advertising research. That's what we do. We're not a media company, we're not an agency, we just report on what's happening in the local market. We got our ear down to the ground, a main street, um, and what's happening, how the local dry cleaner is advertising. That's what we do. Uh, we do it through surveys, we do it through uh, lots and lots of different databases. Anyway, that's what we do, and that's what I want to share with you um, right now. In October 2020, we did a concentrated effort on understanding the world of content marketing as it as it is related to local advertisers. So we did, some of this might be familiar if you've seen some of the work we did last year. Um, we understood that content marketing was showing up everywhere as far as local uh, advertisers are going. This is showing you where, if they were doing content marketing, where they were putting it. And you, you can see it's spread out everywhere, a lot of social media, but then it's, it, it pops up everywhere. There's a heavier presence online than there is uh, in non-digital spaces. 95%, this is again from the local SMBs are saying, yeah, I, I did content marketing and I put it somewhere online as opposed to 52% who said, and I did it in print, you get the idea, 29 broadcast. Finally, we asked them, what are the most effective types of content marketing? This is for the people who do it who understand what it is and have engaged in it, this is what they said. And you can see there's a lot of variety here. There's 
everything from videos to case studies to newsletters. Now you got to remember where everybody's head at, was at in 2020, right? A lot of businesses out there were just got through a summer where they needed to tell their story. What the heck was happening? Especially about one year ago, right now, they were under understanding how they were coming out of a, a pandemic and wanted to get their information out there. And so we saw a lot of engagement here. Okay, so far so good? Great. Let's zoom up to May of 2021. So just a few months ago, we did a, uh, every few months we do a, what we call a Burrell business barometer. And what this is, is the very same questions every few months about the state of the economy and the state of advertising as far as local businesses are concerned. What you're staring at right now is the answer to the question, during the next six months, economic conditions for sustaining a small business in the US will, what, get worse, not change or get better. You see that it's starting to slide to optimism. Yay, that's a good thing, right? Because if you look back at March of 2020, 71% were like, oh God, it's gonna get worse. And now it slid up to kind of an attitude that we had back in 2016, 2017. So that's good. That affects how they spend on advertising, which is this. So we said over the next six months, again, this is a repeated question. My business will spend what on advertising and marketing as it did over the past six months. And what you see is back in March of 2020, this big contraction of, oh man, we, oh uh, gosh, less. Now you can see that it's expanding up to same and 31% saying, yeah, I'm gonna spend more in the next six months than I did in the last six months. Again, back to the levels we saw over here. All good, right? Okay, let's talk a little bit about what they're spending it on. Oh, oh, but first, let's do this. Um, we uh, also asked uh, about, finally, what's on your mind related to advertising? Why I wanted to bring this up is because this was a totally open-ended question. We didn't lead them at all, that you, you're looking at the question. And finally, what's on your mind related to advertising and marketing right now? Here's what I want to focus on is right here, this fourth one down, content messaging. And so we grouped all these together. Content messaging and cutting through the clutter what came in fourth behind or fifth behind ROI, getting on social media, doing something with social media, digital advertising. There's concern about hiring and outsourcing. That's all over the place. But look how high this is compared to targeting or cost containment or supply chain issues. Anything else that uh, comes up to a business mind, they're thinking about content and messaging. Okay, now we'll go forward. June of 2020, we just completed our big local advertiser survey. We do this every year. We talk to thousands of local advertisers. And this is, I'm not going to go through this. This is just eye candy to show you who answered this survey, to show you that we got a kind of a, a wide scope of local advertisers. Over 2,800 local advertisers answered this thing from a variety of different industries and a variety of sizes. Uh, a lot of them smaller because, again, we're talking to local businesses, people in local markets. We're not out there talking to General Mills or, you know, uh, Ford manufacturer or anything like that. We're talking to Ford dealerships in Oshkosh, you know, that kind of a thing. So these are the people we're talking to. Let's look at what they said in terms of content marketing. Okay, here is what they said. They spoke spent on and what they engaged in. So we didn't model this. We didn't change numbers. This is just average of what they told us. So what you see up here, let me show you how to read this because you, you can have these slides, by the way. Um, social media, 57% said, hey, yeah, in 2020, I used, I spent on some kind of social media. That, that's how to read all this. And on average, what they spent. All right, great. So go down to here, content marketing. 16% said they engaged in it. Now, here's where it gets tricky because content marketing can show up anywhere, right? It, it, it can also be, let's say, inside this newspaper number. You know what I mean? So thanks to some of the people on this call, um, content marketing is getting squishy for us researchers. We have to uh, approach it a little bit differently. But what I wanted to show you here is take a look at this number or this column. Percent planning to increase in 2021. Look at that, 
Why is that important? It's the fourth only behind these other three, social media and SEM. Okay, that's a no-brainer. We know that's where a lot of local businesses are focusing their efforts. A lot of interest in OTT and streaming video and then content marketing. There's an investment that wants to be made in content marketing. This is an interesting chart. Now, just stay with me on it, focus on it. What you're looking at on this continuum here are the people who are, let's go this way, the people who used any said thing in 2020, all right, the average use, and the percent of users who are planning to increase. So it's a combination of that table you just saw. And the size of the bubble is the, the relative amount of the average they're spending on it. Here, I think I did a little circle, is content marketing, okay? So it is to the right, in other words, or in, there are more and more people. In fact, it's remember, it's the fourth biggest one from left to right or right to left, I guess you could say, uh, wanting to increase, people wanting to increase it. The average use is, is smaller, but there's a great interest in it. I think, and this is kind of what I get through reading the open-ended, is they just don't know where to go and how to start. They want to tell a story. There's interest in telling a story, but they don't know exactly where to go because it's not like just, just putting an ad on the radio or just putting an ad on TV. There's a little more to it. Um, it's not a DIY fixture. So we asked, hey, what have you bought through a self-serve portal? And what what local businesses are buying through self-serve ad portals are things like social media and SEM. That's where they're spending. Content marketing was down here. Only 9% said, yeah, I bought some kind of what they can consider to be content marketing through an ad portal. Right there. Okay, now I only got two slides left and I'm almost done. So what I wanted to show you is uh, the answer to, hey, you used this in 2020, this, whatever this is, in this case, content marketing, I'm showing you three things here, content marketing, email marketing in red, and social media advertising, right? You use those things in 2020. Do you plan on cutting it, decreasing it, keeping it the same level, increasing, or are you a brand new buyer to this thing? So pay attention to the blue, that's content marketing. So you have 38% of the people who use content marketing last year said, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to have the same investment. 28% said, I'm going to increase it. You have 23% jumping in for the first time. Um, it mirrors in a lot of ways because uh, social is such a big bucket that, that uh, a lot of money and a lot of time is being spent there. But this is pretty hardy and, and on par with other digital, uh, digital uh, means of uh, getting out in front of people as opposed to, final slide, as opposed to, I just picked two random non-digital, radio and cable TV. So blue is still the same, is still the content marketing, there's that 38%. Now this is saying that radio advertisers, not to pick on radio, but 51% of the people who used radio in 2020 said, my commitment's gonna be about the same. Meanwhile, 14% decreasing, 3% cutting. Uh, here's cable TV, 16% decreasing. So it's beating a couple of these non-digital uh, um, digital forms of advertising. So long story short, there's a very, there's very, uh, a lot of interest in content marketing, but maybe not a clear path on going forward from a local advertiser's point of view. Corey, so, I think it's, I think it's fascinating though, that when you gave them an unaided question, which was, <laughs> what are you going to do? They came up with the word content marketing on their own, correct? Yeah. That was the physical words they came up with, which is fascinating because we've been throwing, and we have a lot of names for it in the industry and we, you know, try to dissect it and put it in different buckets. Um, what I'm hearing from other sources is that one of the reasons that more and more businesses want content marketing is they're realizing as they use email and as they use social media, which we both know are getting a massive amount of use now, they, they got to shove something in there, right? I mean, it's got to yeah. be good content. I mean, yeah. You know, and well, uh, remember 2020 was the storytelling year, right? Yeah. Everybody wanted and had to tell what they were doing. Remember back in April 2020, I have to let people know that I'm safe, that you can come into my store. I have curbside pickup, which I know is all 
just you know that's that's commonplace now back then a mere year ago it wasn't and that all had to be related um so in our, in our chat room right now jim is asking a really valid question how are local businesses defining content marketing and you're basically saying they don't know they're just trying to figure it out in their brains yeah, as we it, speak it's it's a good question because in that October survey we did, that very first one I showed you, yeah. we asked. We, we didn't set it up. We said, hey, do you know what content marketing is? And it was kind of split. Some people said, yeah, I do. Some people said, yeah, I don't. Or no, I, I don't. Then we defined it. Then we had a lot of people going, oh, oh, that's it? Oh, yeah, yeah, I do that. So in other words, they, I want a good story. I forgot another reason. Correct me if I'm wrong. They're starting to learn through the nerds and geeks that help them. You're going to come back later on and explain who these influencers are to them. Um, that if I put changing content on my website, Google awards me. So mm -hmm. I got to find something. I mean, I just can't throw a brochure online and have no, nothing change on it because eventually it drops on Google search, correct? One of the things right. in Google's cook, cooking algorithms is changing content, which means, again, I need something. I need a story. I need some content. This is great, Corey. Stick around. We're going to get back All to it. Right. Now I'm going to go. If we're, we're watching the Brady bunch version and i don't know where your camera's got julia i've got her off to my uh to that way that way right <laughs> julia julia you this whole report that came out of burrell associates pretty much launched your new gig which is the branded content project can you just quickly take a few minutes now because you and i've been working together for months yeah. on this right now e emp and the branded content project have partnered so why don't you take it away right now and kind of say all right we saw this data the local media association local media consortium said let's do something together to help monetize this stuff absolutely and i'm going to pull up some slides while we're talking too but but we saw the same thing that corey's saying we've actually worked closely with the team at burrell too when the when the study was put together is we realized there was an opportunity here and and that a lot of the advertisers absolutely want to do more in the space if they weren't if they were already working in the space or they want to to get involved and they realize they don't know how and they don't know where um and then even if they build it where they're going to put it um, which is where we saw a huge amount of a, you know, real opportunity um, and something that Corey and I have talked about and Mike, you and I have talked about it and we talked about it with Brian a lot too, is that there's an opportunity here to really um, add something new for your advertisers uh, and, and that's helping your audiences at the same time. That's really the key and the core of, of what content marketing is, is how do we provide more education um, and some of those things uh, you know, to our advertisers and our audience at the same time. A uh, tiny bit of background on the Branded Content Project and how we even got to this point is this is actually a joint collaboration between the Local Media Association, Local Media Consortium, with funding coming from the Facebook Journalism Project with the goal of, of doing what we're doing here today, which is how do we serve the local media industry and help really elevate uh, high margin, long term, high impact, sustainable revenue for, for more media companies. Um, and a big piece of that is how do we help our advertisers through education, through audience products, and through that sales support? Because they absolutely want to get in the space. They absolutely want to um, add to their content marketing if they're not doing it already uh, and really improve it. And they need you to help. That's something that, that Corey has, has kind of pointed out today. And, and we've seen a lot is they don't know where to start. They don't know how to distribute it. And that's why they need you so desperately right now and why we're seeing such an opportunity. We know everyone has a story to tell. Every single business that you guys work with, they have a passion and a purpose. And that's not something you can easily tell in a 30 second spot or a display ad. So, so think about different ways that your advertisers can tell their story, different ways they can communicate more long form information. Um, and, and different ways and creative ways to get that out to your audiences. And that's really where we're seeing the, the core success. Um, I'm going to run through just a kind of a, a couple best practices with all of you too, just as you guys are hearing what, what Brian and, and Mike and I have done together um, and listening more from Corey, and you're starting to think about your own initiatives, starting to think about what works for your media company and your um, advertisers and your audiences. You know, start to think through some of these best practices and some of the things to keep in mind as you're either building out what you've already started or or actually starting something new. Um, one thing that we always talk about um, is, is peanut butter and jelly. Um, one thing that we see is, is most successful for audiences and advertisers is, is something that has an element of sponsorship and ownership and something that has an element of storytelling. So really those two things together, that peanut butter and jelly, something that we see is successful for all your advertisers. Like how do you give them sponsorship opportunities and how do you give them the ability to tell their story? Really help your audiences um, keep that peanut butter and jelly going. And those two hand in hand is really where we're seeing a lot of the most success. We've been working with media companies over the past three years, 
um, seeing what works in, in every size market, broadcasters, print publishers, digital pure plays, same thing, sponsorship and storytelling is effective, works for audiences and it works for your advertisers. And certainly, and you're probably sitting here and this is something we always talk about, um, it says like, these don't seem like new ideas. Absolutely not. Like these are things that have been around for a century, um, but they're effective. And that's why I wanna make sure that we're servicing the best ideas for all of you. Um, and, and now is the time. I mean, uh, the, what we've been through in the last two years with COVID and everything else, is really position storytelling and being able to market a message in a much more amplified way. The importance of that is, is huge. And so take those old ideas and turn them around a little bit. How do we freshen up things we've done you know, over the course of decades and, and years? How do we turn that into a new idea for our advertisers, giving them a new opportunity to reach our audiences? All right, so I'm gonna go through five things. Best practices, we're gonna go through them real quick. So I wanna make sure we're getting to Brian talking about some, some great success stories, but keep these five things in mind as we're talking today. Education, information, and engagement. Every content marketing plan that succeeds needs to have those three things. You are educating, you are creating an ability to inform an audience, and you are educating and engaging those audiences as well. All right, number two, make sure you're thinking about a unique value proposition for your advertisers. What can you offer them that's different than everyone else can offer? Um, and then what can your advertiser offer that, that's different as well? So storytelling is something that kind of elevates them, puts them next to your trusted brand, makes a very effective campaign for those advertisers. And scarcity is, is huge as well for the local media teams we're working with. You know, that ownership, that exclusivity, a little bit of scarcity, um, they feel like they have that beachfront property. It's very, very important to make sure you're positioning that with your advertisers. Uh, a lot of success that we're seeing through those types of um, methods. Uh, and this is the big one. So we're not selling somebody a piece of content. You're not telling your advertisers all about this one piece of content. You're selling your audience. It's something that Corey's pointed out in the research before, and Mike's and I have talked about it a lot. Um, they need you. They need you to distribute this content. They could create a blog post. You know, They can work with their their cousin in, in his basement and they can build out all sorts of different social media posts and a couple of blog posts, but where are they gonna put it? How are they gonna reach the people they need to reach? And you have those people. So they really need to work with you to make sure that they have the distribution arm as well as that content piece. All right, and last, you know, this is a great way to utilize your owned and operated inventory um, and your audiences. And we include social media audiences. Those are audiences you've built. So content marketing, branded content, all these things we've done in the past, you know, we know that that's something that really utilizes your own inventory and gives you a lot of opportunity to bring new audiences to those advertisers. And what we're gonna talk about today is something that Brian's been doing well, is we know we need to stop interrupting what people are interested in start to be what they're interested in. How do we help our advertisers become that important uh, piece of content that those audiences are looking for? How do we help them inform and engage? Um, that's really what this is all about. So I'm excited to, to show you guys a little bit about what, what Brian and Mike and I have been working on and just kind of talk through different strategies with all of you today. So Mike, I'm going to pass it back over to you. Oh, great. This is very important. Um, Corey's data will be available to everyone at the end of this because Corey, you were flying through those slides. Yeah. <laughs> and there is more meat on the bone that Julia was just showing as well because you, she actually has physical case studies from a lot of different markets that um, are fascinating on how they found business in a myriad of places. But I'm going to now try to bring in Brian. Brian, um, full disclosure now, if I may be so bold, sir, you and I go way back. I cannot remember when I started working with Pamplin Media in my consultancy days prior to acquiring e &P Magazine. Do you have any idea how many years it's been, Brian? I'm trying to I'm trying to figure it out. <laughs> yeah, it's almost been a decade. I think, almost, I think we're coming up on 10 years. All right. Um, and one of the things I'm proudest of is you and I started doing content marketing, correct me if I'm wrong, way ahead of the curve on this, right? I mean, we were building programs to, to build content for advertisers before the report came out. So you and I would think it was funny that you and I were having a conversation with Julie discussing the option of of working with the branded content project. And you said, oh, we're already over, what was it you say? Oh, we're already over a million dollars in, in total revenue from just one new content area. So I, in my humble opinion, sir, I think this is um, definitely worth discussing if you know what I mean. So sure. if you, let's, one of the things that I've, I love about Pamplin Media is no one's ever heard of you. I'm just kidding, but 
you guys fly really low under the radar. You know what I mean? You're, um, it's not like you're always out there in a lot of stages or getting published a lot. Would you just do me a favor and describe what the company is like, your footprint, how, who you guys really are before we dive into the, the, the success you had? Sure. Uh, our intent is not is we do want to be known, but you know we focus uh, on the Portland metro area here in Portland, Oregon. So we're on the West Coast. We have uh, 25 newspapers and websites, all really targeted to local news. Um, our, our dominant core strength is the Portland metro area, as the map here shows. So we've got individual papers serving each of these communities, and we just try to be the best source of local news in each of those communities. And collectively. When you package all the print and digital together, we're, we're reaching over 1.2 million people every single week with our local news. But we really do drill down to our small mom and pop businesses. That's our that's really our niche, and um, that's why I think this, these branded content pieces work so well because um, we're able to make the local chiropractor or the local dentist the expert in their community about local local stuff or their products or their services by the different. Uh, branded content programs we've put out, whether it's about them or them sponsoring different things related to their business in, the, in our papers and websites. You remind me a lot of two other companies that I we talk about a lot in the e &P. One would be um, Sound Publishing up in Seattle, right? I mean, they're, they're owned by Black Press up in Canada, yep. but Sound Publishing is a very hyper-local company that surrounds I, I'm kind of almost a ring around Seattle. When I used to work with them to get to some of their markets, I had to actually fly in a float plane. That's how remote <laughs> some of them were. And the titles of each individual publication are, are, are huge in these small towns, right? I mean, they have some heritage. They've been there for a long time. The difference between you and sound is you really exploit the, the, the corporate identity of Pamplin, correct? Yeah, we're, very, we're, very little said about sound, the word sound publishing. That's just the parent company. Why yeah. is Pamplin? Who is Pamplin? What is Pamplin, if I may be sure. so bold? Sure. Yeah, it's important. Dr. Robert Pamplin Jr. is our owner. He's local. He's local. He lives here in the Portland metro area. Um, he so so much believes in the importance of local journalism and the value it brings to the community. That's why he started purchasing all these papers in the early 2000s, actually in, two, in the year 2000. And um brought it all together just to make sure that there were there was another media voice in the Portland metro area so people could get the get great local news and he's really a firm believer in that and we are so fortunate to have somebody who is invested in our products as him so again to be able to have somebody who actually owns the product lives in the communities and be able to highlight him as the face of our of our papers and, and websites is is such a great asset to us in a community that really cares about local ownership you um you publish twice a week uh, a free paper for the city of Portland. You call it the Portland Tribune. And that's kind of, but that's, but it's not an alternative newspaper. You, the, you guys have the, uh, uh, what is, it's the Willam, I can never say correctly, Willamette. Willamette. Willamette Weekly yeah. is your alternative. So yeah. you still serve the Metro, the city itself, but it's mostly the, the surrounding area, correct? That, that exactly. You're really Actually, serving. The Portland, thanks to COVID, the Tribune is out now just once a week, but okay. um, you know, the strength of us, the Tribune is a free product and is our largest paper, but uh, our, our community papers, which surround the Portland metro area, are all subscriber based for the most part. And um, so, again, it's the combination of us being able to offer Portland distribution through the Tribune, but the ability for people to buy ads in any of our other products based on whatever community they want to target it gives us a little uh, of a, um, an edge over our competition because people want to target, as we know, through digital, and we can do it through our print or digital products. All right. Now, you also have a very robust digital presence as well and a digital agency. So you, you were very advanced. You were doing digital services um, many years ago. You started selling uh, above and beyond your core products. The Pamplin Digital Media, tell us a little bit more about the op the, what you offer there as well for advertisers. Sure. We, we focus on just being a digital agency. And our goal, like anything else, is when we meet with a client, we want to be able to walk in and offer them a full set of solutions to whatever their marketing needs might be. And so uh, we brought on Shelly Lundgren. Unfortunately, couldn't be on the call today. She's out sick. But um, if Shelly was here, she'd be talking about all the efforts she's made to train our staff and make sure that when one of our marketing advisors goes in to meet with the client, they're trying to assess their needs and offering them multiple solutions as to how to help them grow their business and being able to package all these digital products together in addition to whatever print and online stuff we have to offer as well is what's going to, I mean, our goal is to 
again, help our clients grow their business and be successful. And we feel that obviously if they're doing that, then they're going to continue to partner with us for years to come. And, you know, that's why, you know, again, having a local owner and our consistent efforts to, to be good partners with our clients is what's helped us kind of grow throughout this uh, whole challenge through COVID. Talk to me about the hierarchy in sales. Um, you do have digital specialists, correct? Or did you, I like to use the term, weren't you and I throwing around the term years ago of digital evangelist, people exactly. that support yeah. the local reps, do they still exist? Do they work hand in hand or four-legged or how do you, how do you deploy them throughout the team? Yeah, we have two digital specialists right now. Shelly is one. And then uh, we have another person and they, they will go out on a call with our reps and, uh, depending on you know, the, the level of, a, of questions that a client might have in terms of what their digital needs are, they'll uh, be able to help that client if it gets really high tech or high intensity. But for the most part, we really work hard at training our, all our reps to uh, offer both. And if they have any questions, they can come back and get advice from any of our digital specialists. But it, we, don't, we, uh, we actively actually a- ask our folks to work as a team and, and sell in that fashion. How motivated are your reps to sell digital or do they... I mean, you know, you always have that. I mean, this, here's something we've never heard in our industry, which is uh, I have too many things to sell. I know we never hear that out there, right? From your reps, you know, I have too many things on my plate to sell. But how, how, I mean, how do you keep them motivated? Is it through compensation, training, all of the above? What's the culture like? Yeah, I mean, I think the goal right now is I have one, I have a lot of new reps who are working with us all in their 20s. And so the, they gravitate to the digital right out of the gate. And, and secondly, when they walk in and lead with digital, um, they're going to get a much better response versus if they say, Hey, I'm here with the Lake of Sweet review or the Portland Tribune. You know, obviously the first thing that a lot of people say is I don't do print anymore. So instead of getting the door shut on us, we say, no, we actually offer a lot of digital options. We're a full service digital agency and we can package that all together. So you know, our reps are, are very motivated to include the digital because they know um, it's a combination of that. Plus our print is what's going to get that ROI for our clients, which we know that's what they, that's what they're trying to gauge every single day is what's my ROI. And that's why I love the branded content stuff, because that's what gets people knowing that uh, it's working. All right. So we're going to turn the corner on that. I see some people raising hands. If you just joined us, we're watching the chat room only, if that's okay with you, any questions, any comments, take Brian on, ask a question of anyone we will share it with the group. That's the chat room. And please, when you go to the chat room, make sure you're sending your message to everything. So let's get into the solutions you currently offer when it comes to branded slash sponsored content. This is an example of one of your sponsored content articles, correct? This is the, what, What's the story behind this? Yeah, this is a, um, a yearly special section we do called Amazing Kids. Um, we give businesses the opportunity to be the sponsor of this of, of their of the local amazing kid, and um, you know when we're doing 25 of these stories and selling 25 businesses on being the sponsor of this story, they love it because it's positive news. They like to help us share the stories of these amazing kids and inspire others to do the same. So, businesses, you know, we have business. We've been doing this for almost 10 years now. And we have businesses who never want us to not go to them first. They, they love being associated with this, with this great content. And um, we've now implemented it, not just with amazing kids, but also um, on other products we do related to veterans, teachers, community heroes, um, sports, um, you name it. Um, there's always a business who wants to be there to say, yeah, I'm helping s- spread the news about these great kids by sponsoring these stories. Now that story also appeared on, online as well. My question sure. is, who generated that content for you? Do you deploy, I mean, is it your editorial team? Do you have a separate team of writers that are working? How did you find the kid? Who selected the kid? Was this a, like, like we do at EMP, did we have nominations or, I mean? Yeah, we, we work it both ways in our company. <clears throat> in this instance, we seek nominations from our communities to, to okay. nominate kids. The news team makes the selection and then one of our reporters interviews the kids. Other products we do, we actually have dedicated reporters who work with businesses to write their content. But in this case, and other similar ones related, like I said, veterans and teachers. It's all our reporters who are writing this content. See, that, 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 that's a classic thing. We just did our 15 under 50 at EMP. Then we do 25, no, 25 under 35, 15 over 50. I got to keep remembering these numbers, but we have people nominate them. Then the editorial team grabs that and, and writes quality content, but we always get sponsorships for it. It's, it's impossible. It's a, just a great win, win, win. Um, this is, again, what one of the things that Julia was suggesting. And Julia, I remember this is 
you were screaming, not screaming, but you were saying uh, exclusivity. Scarcity, we all know in sales, scarcity increases desire. People want what they can't have. In this case, Brian and, and Julia, I, I'm assuming that it's one sponsor per kid, right? You're not giving 20. Correct. All right, cool. Um, Carlene is asking an excellent question right now. She's saying, um, do we sell SAO? The answer is Carlene is standby. I'm going to show you that in just a moment because, yeah, I'm, I'm all about that when I was helping uh, Brian launch some of these. Here's another one, Brian. Uh, give us the, the background on this. This is obviously has to do with a killer uh, uh, business category now, which is home improvement, correct? Is this a similar type campaign where you had a special section and everybody is sponsoring quality content? Yeah, we, what we did with this is uh, we knew a, a lot of these businesses wanted to tell their own story, uh, as Julia's talked about, and, and you have as well. So when we hit the home, home and garden category really hard uh, during the middle of COVID, we packaged this by telling an advertiser, if you committed to three full page ads, we would give you a, a, a one time story within one of those sections that they could either write or we would write for them. And what um, and they loved it because again it's it's an opportunity to tell their story as an advertiser and the content that they offered was really good stuff. I mean uh, we've been doing similar things like this for a long time and people um, really enjoyed it. Um, and the, and it's 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 great in terms of it's very valuable in terms of it, it's good stories, very readable, it makes a lot of sense. Um, this home and garden section you Mike showing right now is something we did um, in the spring and it generated you know, over $60,000 in sales for us. But the sponsored stories, in addition to being within the section themselves, um, something else we're trying to do is, is again, making sure that people are seeing these sponsored stories. So if somebody committed to doing a story, we then highlighted that story in an email blast to all our, uh, to our email newsletter subscribers. We did a dedicated home and garden one and, and teased it to, hey, see the whole section, but then highlighted the advertiser stories on that email blast. So suddenly not only are advertisers, uh, the stories being read in the paper, but now we're pushing out digitally, highlighting them through our social media platforms. But again, pushing those stories out in every way possible, just to make sure the advertiser feels they're getting the ROI. Um, and the readership on these emails was through the roof. So again, quality content in the email. Luckily, that's what the business you guys are in. All right, now here, what was this? This was a, this is this is this is pretty much a, a, a complete article about a specific advertiser, correct? Epic Custom yeah. Dream Home in Lake Oswego. Who who wrote this puppy? Was this uh, editorial? I doubt it. You had someone from the marketing team write this, correct? Actually, in this case, the advertiser wrote it himself. He wanted to highlight this listing, which was multi. It was I don't know, three or four million dollar listing, um, premier property in in the community. He wanted to highlight it with this with a story that he had put together not only selling the stone home and all its features, but highlighting him as the person to, to go to. Um, Terry Sprague is a very smart advertiser. He gets the value of these stories. He loves doing them. And um, it really tied in perfectly with what with, with Julia is suggesting, again, is allowing an advertiser to tell a story either about a product he's got to offer, or in some instances, he'll, he'll, do, he'll buy a full page and highlight you know, his thoughts on what's happening in the market. Again, trying to make him become the expert in the community related to, to real estate. Uh, I got a great question here from uh, Nanette, and I'm sorry that the, the type is so small. Does it say sponsored content somewhere within that thing? Does it uh, alert the audience that that's not from your editorial team? Yeah, at the very top, it does say paid advertising. Paid um, advertising, okay. Yeah, and, All uh, right. and, and when we, when we do I, post this online, you'll see here, as Mike just shown right now, we do say story sponsored by underneath the headline to make sure people know as well as if we post it on our social media streams, we're making sure that people see the differentiation between a regular story versus if it's paid. I got to ask this, you are selective on what advertiser written content you take. Someone skimmed this, right? And make sure it was worthy of, did someone edit this? And do you have someone that takes a look at it first? Yeah, we, 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 give, it a, we give it a once over. Um, the reality is in a lot of these stories, it's not like it's controversial stuff. I mean, it's Here's this is a story about a dream home, you know, so it's not like you're going to get somebody upset about it other than a competing realtor. But when it comes to other things related to real estate, uh, you know, medical, whatever, I mean, I think we, we do have a news team that looks it over, make sure that it's nothing controversial, inappropriate. Um, you always want to give it that once over, especially if an advertiser isn't that savvy on the news side, you want to protect them and make sure that you're helping them out in terms of helping them put out a good product. 
Matt wants to know, and I think this, I think it's a, a, a darn valid question. Um, Matt's asking when you're going to the advertiser, do you lead with the print and is the web kind of the second part of it, or is the web the first part and the print the backup, or is it kind of you're presenting a multimedia approach directly to the advertiser? Yeah, it's really geared as a print first and then use social media to tease back. Hey, see so-and-so story in this week's local paper, um, building awareness both ways. Um, and, and again, also making sure you're always trying to play that advertiser's photo, because again, if people go to the store and this guy's walking around, they're going to say, hey, Terry, I saw your picture in the paper. I saw your picture online. That's that ROI. And again, I have, we had actually sold an auto guy, an auto, auto service repair business. And we told him, hey, well, if you sign up for this program, we're going to make you famous. Uh, the rep checked back with him three months later. And the guy's like, you know what? I can't go anywhere, Katie, without people stopping me, asking me about questions they saw in the paper. Uh, about my stories or just people knowing you, who I am. You so, ask any, any outdoors, you know, billboard salesman, why they put the realtor's picture on the billboard. And what you will hear is that everybody says, I saw your face. It's mm -hmm. tough. Why do, why do some auto you know, type TV stations make sure that the uh, auto dealer is always in the commercial, but no, it's a smart play. Um, this is what I, this is the program that we launched with you years ago. Um, the name we called it was Insiders. You're going to learn more in a second that what it really was is a knockoff of a program that's been around for decades, right? Uh, Brian called Ask the Experts or Ask the Pros. We just decided to take the Ask the away because when you say to the advertiser, we're going to launch this as Ask the Pros, the advertiser thinks everybody's going to ask him questions online. So let me see if I can describe this, or you can kind of describe it. You have a very robust section. You even feature some of these on your homepage of tons and tons of industry insiders. And again, if you got a veterinarian from a specific market area, that's the only vet, right? So there's, again, that scarcity issue. You, you offer exclusivity to product category? We do for the most part. There are certain industries that there's so many of them, we may be limited to the first two or four, but for the most part, we do offer um, exclusivity from that very standpoint to get them to make sure they don't allow their competitor to buy it out, out from underneath them. You just don't park all these guys in one spot. Do you have content blocks that are rotating through the website as well in various pages with these guys' pictures, or is it just one area on the website where they see it? Runs in a, it it's your point. It runs in a couple of different places. Right. It, it, it's, it's appearing, as you're showing here, at the bottom of the page. It's also rotating on, on the side of our website, depending if you're looking at a single story. Um, and then we're also you know, highlighting this on, on our social media page, too, to tease people back to see their story. Um, the real benefit, though, is as these stories are percolating month after month, year after year, it's that, you know, you see this, the readership of this content since it's evergreen is, is helping those advertisers over time. Well, so. okay, so let's, before we get into specific story, what you're doing then is you're allowing a print digital combo to happen where there's a, a, a small little gang page of some kind that you've you're presenting in some of your different products in different ways, but it's all boils down to the same thing. Somebody wrote this story for this veterinarian, correct? Correct. And you pay a writer to do that for the, I mean, I, I know this for a fact, getting a small business owner to find time to do anything is impossible, let alone write his own content. Am I right? Yeah. So I mean, yeah. The hardest thing to be honest is once you get them sold on it, it's, it's helping them come up with the stories. So our writers are, are actually doing their homework before even writing the stories, giving the suggestions as what the stories could be. In this case though, this, you know, our writer didn't come up with feline immune deficiency virus. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> he, he probably did a lot of the work himself on this one, but again, getting the, sometimes the advertisers just to come up with the, the story theme is, is a real challenge. You gotta help them all along the way. It's not easy. And, then, okay, and you mentioned it's evergreen. So in other words, this one story will appear once in your legacy product, but it's gonna live forever on your website. And again, evergreen notice the face ladies and gentlemen you don't put their logo there don't be lazy you make them the expert they're the star am i right that's okay. what you're trying to do here but then it cooks on google and this is the question about seo we had previously uh, keep in mind that the title is everything what are fiv and felv if someone uh, the search here i did was feline i can't even pronounce it the, the virus and the name of the town, because that seems to me illogical. Oh my God, does my cat have this? Is there a doctor who takes care of it? This story came up um, 
what number number three no number one under two ads two national ads so you came up number one on the organic not even the news search and this you this must be percolating all over the place right correct all right and this is this something that you make sure the advertiser sees that they know that their their stories are optimizing i assume so yeah we would try to give them reports um, on a consistent basis, showing them, you know, how what the story reads are, how many people are, are looking at the stories, and if we can find examples of this, we'll definitely highlight it. As well as, you know, these these are sold on a, on a one year package. Uh, the commitment is they have to run the story once a month. Plus, we're posting it online and on our social media platform, and hopefully, we've we've done a good job of packaging it with regular ads in the paper, ads uh, on our website, targeting through other digital means, but packaging it on a lot of different levels and uh, so these are really sold as an overall package and so it's not a once a month that's it again the goal is as mike always talks to it's all about consistency and frequency and um, so that's what these programs are really geared around um now this is where i want to get into the sales process let's 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 bring back um a, a corey if we may one of the things corey i when that report came out during covid one of the things I did was have Gordon, uh, one of his best quotes ever on one of my vodcasts, he said, the deer have the guns. I'm sure you've heard that one, right, Corey? I mean, <laughs> but, well, that I love, can be applied to about anything, but okay. <laughs> but one of the things he kept stressing was, if you want to write content, you may find different businesses that will never advertise with you unless you're doing a local chamber of commerce industry salute in other words the manufacturing businesses in your town that yeah. sell their products away are not necessarily interested in a local customer unless they're doing recruiting or or trying to do something in the hr or the you know the just we're just a great town leader thing but you could use your resources correct me if i'm wrong to go after these businesses you're not going to sell any of your you may not sell any of your media to park the stories on but correct me if I'm wrong, Gordon was all about this. These businesses are craving content as we speak. Am I correct? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it, it comes back to storytelling, right? It comes back to telling your story. And we're seeing that we're growing up with it. We're understanding it. We're being bombarded by content and, and story through social media and things like that. And so, yeah, but here's where I'd caution, and I will not go against Gordon. Um, I think he's right but it's a totally different marketing spin, right? Right. Because the one thing I'm telling you, I'll stand on a soapbox and scream it from a top of a mountain um, that local businesses want. They don't want products. They want a content, they want a marketing strategy. So somebody in the, um, in the chat asked, what are the three things that, you, that are a must have? And I, you guys know better than I do about running a, a, a local uh, sales organization, but I would hope that one of them would be understanding where content marketing takes place in the entire marketing continuum, right? Because that's what local businesses want. They just don't want an opportunity to tell their story. They want that, but they want it. They would really like it in context of everything else. This, so. Julia, you're nodding your head. Not everybody's watching your face. I'm watching all the monitors now, but jump in. You're seeing that from the client markets you're working with as well, correct? Absolutely. I mean, it's it's one thing to build something beautiful, but but where are you going to put it and who's going to see it? And so coming up with a distribution plan is absolutely like the one-two punch you have to put behind these things. There you go. Um, and, 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 you know, honestly, that recurring revenue too. I see a lot of questions about that in the chat too. So this isn't a, a one-shot deal. It's not a one-time article and then drop it in there. You know, think about how you can come up with a monthly or a weekly strategy and then how you're going to distribute that, you know, Brian mentioned social, and then you've got digital and you've got print and basically use all your assets, right? So let's get into that. Now, you and I, Julia, got together because I came to, so we both started talking about, you know, I have 22 years of media sales experience. You have decades as well, so I'm much older than you, Julia. I don't want to imply you're my age. I'm, I'm old. But <laughs> the main street of yesterday, I learned how to sell yeah. media in the late 70s and 80s in a small town selling AM radio. And I was able to walk down a main street and knock on doors. I think we all agree now that the world has shifted. Um, good or bad, right or wrong, COVID or not COVID, any way you want to look at it right now, if you want to put together a marketing strategy, A, like Corey just said, and Julia backed up, but B, God forbid, he said sarcastically, sell your media along with 
the content. I mean, that's what you just heard, Brian. We're going to bring him back in a moment. You're, you got to, that's what it's all about because not only are you charging them for content, you're placing the content in context. And Shelly was all about this, Brian. I'm sorry that she's not with us today, because, but Shelly kept telling me when I was doing the webinar for you, what I'm going to get to is please mention that we put the content in our publications. These, the, you know, it's, it's commingled is I think the term I used or infused into credible local, local platforms. And isn't that important in this whole play, Brian? It is for sure. And, and, and again, it's the, the more that you can disseminate the information in a variety of ways, the greater the likelihood that they're going to get a response and that ROI and it's going to can, can help them continue to do it with us. So now, we, the number based on just the project you and I and Julia did is a close to $200,000 of new revenue in the past five or six weeks. Am I correct, sir? You are correct. All right. Yeah. So let's talk about how we did that. We yeah. put together the targeting list of in my, and I put this list out all the time based on all the different things we're looking at. And Corey, I'm willing to bet if I were, I'm not if you can put, take, you know, your, put your spectacles on and look at the screen, <laughs> but basically what you're seeing is service related businesses exactly. that fall, fall into categories now that aren't retail. <laughs> and these are hard businesses to prospect. They are hard. Because, you know, you might have a heating and air conditioning guy who's driving the truck, right? Dad's driving the other one, his kid's driving the other one. And it's not like knocking on a retail door and standing in, in you know, and lawyers, correct me if I'm wrong, the last category to realize yellow pages are dead, are now looking for new solutions. Real estate is on fire because we're now in a, we're now in a seller's market, which means they want to get listings, which means they don't want to buy verticals. They want to get the home listing. They want to talk to the homeowner. And Corey, I want to bring you back in. This is a slide from a few years ago, but it's, I had I did a speech with Gordon. We did a road tour for Site Impact, another company that I know is very tight with you guys. And we were, but he he showed this. And I remember when he showed this slide. He correct me if I'm wrong, Corey. You said it yourself. These businesses consider themselves novices at marketing. Am I right? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. It's not like we asked them, "Hey, are you a novice at marketing?" What we asked was, "Are you in?" Well, first of all, they had to be in charge of marketing, or their marketing. How often, how many hours a week have you, do you do marketing for your business? And how many years have you been doing marketing? So we just had them fill that out. Then we took that information and said, okay, these guys, depending on their total number of hours they've been doing marketing are novices, apprentices, practitioners, and masters. And it, it makes perfect sense. These guys over half are novice marketers. And then, yeah, <laughs> this slide, let me put a little context. We asked at one time, and it hasn't really changed any. No. Uh, this was speaking about digital services specifically. Somebody had mentioned digital services in the chat. Uh, email management, blog management, social media management, SEO, all that stuff. We asked, great. So who does that for you? This is the answer they gave us. They being everybody in our, in our, um, in our survey. So obviously what this says is, they're going everywhere. There's no one solution for these uh, things. Or as, as Gordon said on the stage, the Daryl in the garage down the street. Yeah, now, exactly. I mean, there, there were people who said, oh, my wife takes care of that. So, so, so with all this being said, this is what Julie and I did. We put together, well, it goes back to how I, when I was, I still do it on the side, but I have a magazine to run now. I learned over the years in a confusing world, the best way to get new business leads is educate them. So I developed this workshop series and I was doing them in hundreds of cities, did them for Gatehouse, did them for WIC, did them did, did, in the old days for the old Gannett. I mean, and what I would do is go into it and, and, and you provide a workshop that is educational. It's not in any way, shape, form or size a timeshare meeting, but the trick in sales, and you may disagree with me, Julia does, because you, know, you, you and I both come from the sales side, the trick is during the workshop we created Fear of Loss. What we say to the business is that, okay, in, in order, marketing is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Branding is essential in today's world. And one of the best ways to brand is telling a story. I mean, duh. And then what we did was we explained something that Julia said, what is your unique selling proposition? I mean, you have to have one when you're selling to a media company. I just explained one of the best reasons that to put sponsored content in Pamplin Media is you're surrounding it with great local journalism. In the case of the business, they all have their own unique selling propositions. And at the end of the workshop, we simply passed out a form and said, what is your 
you know, and that we scared them about, and I hate to scare, fear of loss. Do you have a high top of mind awareness, Toma quotient, we called it. And what is your unique selling proposition? And people would want to set up appointments. Well, here came COVID. So I created the workshop via Zoom. And actually I did it for E&P for about 50 different you know, media companies. And all it was about was like feeling the pipeline. So how did Brian and Pamplin come up with all this revenue? The answer was we created a brand new product um, called How to Grow Your Business Through the Art of Storytelling. Now, Julia, the graphics on this were amazing. You guys put this together and we've done this now for a couple markets. And correct me if I'm wrong, I, we, we positioned me as, as the expert, as an outside expert. Brian, is that important? And I, I mean, that would you rather have the outside guy do it or should you do it on your own, in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, it's always great validation to be able to say you were bringing in a national expert to offer tips. And I, and I think it helps us position ourselves as, hey, we're, what I love about this is we can say, hey, we're helping local businesses as we come out of this COVID situation. So it's a, it's a win-win for us because, you know, it looks like and we are, we're helping them grow their business. Thanks to bringing in someone like you and Julia. So, so then we created, you know, a CRM system that instantly took those that registered and obviously sent them the coordinates to, to attend the workshop. Brian, we got your rep psyched as well to go out and hand out and invite people, but you did it in a myriad of different ways. You pushed social media, you put it on your website, and you also pushed an email, am I correct, sir? Correct, yeah, every, every way we could to reach our local business owners, we wanted to fill that pipeline with as many people as possible, knowing that it was a great opportunity to sell not just uh, sponsored content, but everything else we have to offer. Exactly. I mean, because if, if the guy didn't want sponsor content, that's okay. But attend this How to Grow Your Business workshop through the art of branding and storytelling. We trained the reps, got them all excited. More importantly, told them who to target, what to say, best bets. And then we ran a live Google Sheet on all the attendees that Julia, me, and Brian were watching diligently as we promoted the workshop over a two and a half, maybe three week period. And Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, it's really, really, really started to fill up near the end. This is one thing I think I learned over time is people do register for these things late. I think we had maybe 50 sign up that morning. Am I correct, okay. sir? It, it was, it was- We had probably at least 20 sign up that morning. I know that. And like anything else, people are trying to figure out what their day holds and they'll wait till the last day or two to figure it out. And so don't, don't sweat it when the signups are a little light two weeks out is what I'm saying. Exactly. And here was the magic. We also had your reps invite people to it and then they filled the CRM and we added a special field called referred by. That way you could keep track of any of the leads that were coming to the workshop that were invited by a rep, correct? Correct. Okay, so here was the final number, 194 registered for one Zoom workshop, 127 attended. Again, the model was the same. It wasn't a timeshare meeting. We created fear of loss. And at the end, we did our own needs analysis. Basically, I bribed them and said, you know, I'll get to give you a free copy of my book if you like, if you'll just fill out the top three forms, but also rate the workshop for us. If you have interest in learning more about branding your business, tell us your target market. Tell us what your unique selling propositions are. Tell us the best time of day for meeting. And Brian, we got instantly 24 instant meeting requests. Am I, I mean, that was pretty good. But then what you did is had all of these leads. You had a list of the attendees. And how did you, what did you do next? I mean, how did you keep the, because the, the, your dollars kept growing. What was your sales tactic with the sales team? I mean, the, the goal was really to not only use this as a springboard for uh, the people who attended this, but all our businesses in our community. So the content that both Mike and Julia shared was awesome. I mean, it really showed how valuable it was because in terms of those 127 people that attended, hardly any of them fell off toward the end of the presentation like you might see. They stayed till the very end. And then we, again, use that information to um, focus our reps to go out and talk about the importance of advertising now as we come out of COVID and highlighted all the different options that they even either asked for within the, the questionnaire that Mike had, or just as we interviewed them and talked about, tried to figure out what their marketing needs were, but just committed to a, a program where we told our reps, hey, for the next two months, we're really going to be dedicated to getting these meetings and focus on selling these yearly programs that, you know, utilize all our media to, um, to help them be successful. And so it was a great just springboard for us in terms of just Again, as Oregon com was coming out of COVID at the time, 
um, to, to, to jumpstart us to, to really set the table for the last half of our year and for 2022. And I assume a lot of these were businesses you weren't doing business with. This was a good new business generator. Correct. Yeah. Uh, a lot of, a lot of new businesses that we hadn't talked to. And um, again, having Mike and Julia talking, it, it really did uh, bring a lot of credibility to us in terms of people recognizing that, Hey, Pamplin's here to help. So, All right. so that's pretty much what we were trying. I mean, I think in an hour, we pretty much gave you the information you're looking for. In other words, Thank you, Corey. I, I really appreciate your valuable time, sir, because I know you're a busy guy, but you were there telling us why sponsored content was important and what the appetite is for it. But then I also wanted to just stick around and tell us why the advertiser needs help. So I think I've summed it up pretty well, Corey, and you're going to share that data with us that we can share with anyone that goes to editorandpublisher.com right now slash get info. Am I correct, sir? Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, it's all there that we, we did a report on content marketing. A while ago, but yeah, the the hunger is there. It's absolutely, and again, it's not just content marketing. They need help marketing. You saw that's the reason they sign up two hour, you know, twenty minutes before the webinar is because they've got a truck to unload, right? <laughs> I mean, they they they've got other things they have to do. So any intelligence you can bring towards the overall marketing plan, that's ACES. That's what they want. Um, Julia, you have put together a complete. Uh, overview of the program that they, they will get a, a download for as well. Yes. Um, I also wanted to make sure that anybody that had questions for Julia and I who helped put together this, there's our contact information. I don't know if that's your mobile, but that's mine, Julia. I mean, feel free okay. to text me if you like, if you want to talk more about how my, my role in this was the workshop, right? I mean, I, I worked hard at helping fill the leads pipeline. Julia, you've become quite an expert now and what different flavors, can I use that term? Of flavors is a good one, yeah, this is very visual. That's a perfect word. Yeah, but, but, but that's important. I mean, because certain types of content and you actually already have pre-created content like, like um, Brian has for yes. home improvement, for elderly care um, and a number of different, like what kind of the categories do you have right now? Just Yeah, I mean, sustainability and parenting and, and cannabis is an easy one to sell if you're able to do that, uh, financial. So, you know, that's the thing is, is definitely reach out. You know, again, that's my cell number. Happy to answer texts or happy to take emails. I see lots of questions in the chat about all sorts of things, but you know, we're, we're here to serve as a resource. We have products for you. You know, we can work with you to come up with something similar that we did with Brian and Pamplin. Like there's all sorts of things that we can talk about. So just make sure you reach out. We have um, training and all sorts of things we'd love to share with you. Editor at publisher.com slash get info. Don't ask me why the and sign cannot be used. That's why it's editor and publisher. Brian, um, if someone wants to reach out to you by email and learn a little bit more about how you've really knocked it out of the park. I mean, you're definitely doing seven digits now with various forms of content marketing. Um, what is your email address, Brian? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. I just want to give a quick shout out to both Mike and Julia. I mean, they were awesome in terms of helping us uh, leverage this. I can't say enough about how easy Julia makes it in terms of having that content ready to go. And again, if you're not in a position to be able to hire a reporter, have somebody do it, her team takes that care, takes care of that for you. So utilize her services. Um, and then Mike, just a class act. And, and again, I still hear comments today from people who attended that conference saying what great information that was and how valuable it was. So um, top notch across the board to all you folks. Well, thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful day. We're slightly over time, but I hope you saw value in this today. Yes, um, there's another webinar next week and you can learn more about that at editorandpublisher.com or there's actually a link in the chat room as we're going to talk about using apps and engage with mobile devices. Everyone have a great day, success, and please, please stay healthy. Thanks so much.